Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this final session of today's AI conference. We appreciate all your participation and enthusiasm. Um, for this final session, I will be posting a link to a survey in the chat. So we, we ask that you complete that survey, that evaluation to help us as we prepare and plan for future events. Uh, for this final session, I do want to turn it over to Ron Wilson, who's going to be talking about crafting a cohesive generative AI learning strategy for a graduate program. Ron. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, I, I am uh, the uh, Assistant Graduate Program Director for the University of Maryland Baltimore County's uh, Geographic Information Systems Program. Uh, we're part of the Geography and Environmental Systems Department. Uh, and I run this program with uh, Dylan Mamoudi, uh, who's the Graduate Program Director. We sort of share our responsibilities. He's unavailable right now. He's uh, out of town. Uh, so it's, it's going to be me. Uh, I'm also an instructor in the program. The GIS program has actually been around for quite a long time, uh, and it kind of went. We we went through a change in leadership, uh, and I took over the assistant role and helped them revamp it. And uh, been working with Dylan to try to find more modern and creative ways to to, to really enhance our program and and give students uh, something more than just an educational experience on the topic. So when gen generative AI came out. Um, me personally has been in my career, uh, saw the advantage of this right away. I don't, I, I think there's a lot of hype out there about the, you know, generative AI, but I, I think uh, they're overlooking some things for a certain type of thinker and uh, people who have different skills uh, that this is really uh, a fantastic tool. So <clears throat> I've been in academia all my life in my career. And so when I started talking to Dylan about this, I was like, you know, I'm hearing everybody talk about using Gen AI and another lot of programs. And uh, a lot of them, we started thinking about this six months ago. Uh, you know, it just seemed like there was this ad hoc use of it in the classrooms. And I'm like, you know what, the research is starting to show that you know, the workforce uh, employers want students trained in this. They want them to use, be able to use it and demonstrate their human sides of it. And the candidates who are going to get hired are the people who have that training. And when you are expecting that, there needs to be a systematic training in place. Uh, and so I told him, I said, this can't, our program, if our instructors are going to be using it, we can't just let it be ad hoc and hodgepodge of instructors teaching it. However, uh, you know, they decide to use it or uh, employ it or if at all. And we're kind of like, you know, um, we, we want to give the instructors a lot the freedom to do what they want in the classroom and how much they want to use it but it has to be still within a framework uh, because as we are advertising as our program is like we will train you in the use of ai and you will get it in a systematic way much like a graduate program is designed for and since we have that framework we can start putting it together and so that it is an ad hoc and it is more coordinated so that's sort of the drive behind that is that we want to offer and we are sure our students because we had an information session uh, for potential candidates. And one of the students asked me, how are you going to protect me from AI? And that got us thinking, oh, that's a good question. So we better start thinking about answering that. And we were able to provide her an answer, but it did spark a lot of this to start saying, well, we need to do this in a systematic way, which is, you know, curriculum development and everything. So uh, we w want to give them, you know, you know about the two technical and analytical assessments in terms of critical thinking. I mean, this is what is allowing us to do. Um, but I also what we're thinking about building into the program methodological strategies because a lot of programs and a lot of classes just sort of teach you how to do things but they don't really highlight the methodological aspect of it and if we're going to use critical thinking and if we're going to use a tool like generative ai like any other science tool we have to think about it in terms of a method so we highlight not only solving technical problems uh in use of critical thinking uh but and analytical assessments but methodological strategy so that we we teach our students how to do that. Again, all this sort of needs to be communicated across the curriculum and integrated in it. So in the end, our students emerge from the program as, as superior candidates, knowing how to be the human in the equation. 
because uh, you know a lot of you know the the rumors out there are like oh Gen AI is going to replace this and but the research isn't showing that the research is showing that employers want candidates to know how to use it but they also want them to know how to be the human in it because everybody we're recognizing it's like the human is still needed so this was sort of the drive behind that so our systematic program information is sort of driven by the research that's out there and informs us what way to go. And since we're in a, uh, an applied science program, uh, we were paying attention more to the workforce development research. Uh, and, uh, you know, my wife being an educator in the workforce uh, of, of workforce development, uh, she's helping me along the way. And she asked me if we had a curriculum uh, matrix. And I said, yes, of course, we, we, we've got one. Uh, and it's become our framework for getting this starting so we can assess across the program. So it's a way of organizing ourselves. I'll show you that in a, in, in a minute. So uh, I'll just actually go to it now. And so here's our, here's our matrix here where we have all of our classes listed out in our program, highlighting which ones are core, which ones are uh, elective. And here's all our objectives off to the side for which we, we integrated down in here, um, one in generative AI. And so these are the classes that I teach. And so I'm providing guidance to uh, our instructors to say, because a lot of them are like, we're not sure how you want us to use it. the programming classes. They are pretty clear, uh, but they have questions about it. But there's other classes that we're not sure how we're going to use it. So I'm starting with the curriculum matrix to put in a line here that this is an objective. And I give them examples of like how I'm integrating it into my course by saying, all right, Here's all the objectives in my course here and here. How am I going to use Gen AI? So it's a way of looking at and summarizing what the basics are of, of, of each of the classes and allowing them to start thinking, here's the general ways that we're going to do it. So I send each one of the instructors there because they filled this matrix out. I gave them their class and I gave them our objectives. We trained them on our objectives. And now we're sending it back with this new addition of uh, integrating generative AI into it. And they're to review and connect each one of these objectives from what they wrote into what's going to be in this particular cell here for the matrix. So we've started off with a framework of saying, okay, great, we've got this. Uh, we can build up this as a structure in an organized way. So from that, we're asking them to redevelop their educational materials. And, you know, I'm trying to lead by example, as well as Dylan. Uh, and we're working, we've paired up with the more eager and the more uh, enthusiastic faculty members who are wanting to do this, who, who see how they can do it. Or uh, one particular faculty member was like, I'm not sure how to use it, but I'm ready to use it. So we've uh, we started to redevelop those educational materials, and I'll get to some of those when I go through the examples of the technical and analytical classes. Uh, we've you know made sure to clear to our faculty that we're taking a non-punitive approach uh, because we've had a couple of faculty members come to us and say, "Hey, I'm sure they're using ChatGPT, and I don't know what to do about it. Is this, is this cheating? Is this is this are we allowing this?" So we work to communicate with them in a faculty training about how we're going to integrate generative AI. We've already had a faculty meeting. We've laid out our philosophy behind this. Uh, we've provided them a guide to how to think about it, not just the technical things of like, here's what we want you to do. It's more of a guide that says, here's what we're thinking. And we've also put podcasts together to communicate to the university, but also for our faculty to watch uh, about our approach to it. Because we don't want them punishing students for what we're training them on and teaching them. So, uh, you know, once they've learned that we're taking that approach, they're like, okay, we'll start to think about how to use it, use the materials. Um, so with that, you know, I said, we train instructors with guides and workshops because it's easily digestible. Most of our faculty are adjunct. Uh, so we have to make these in digestible chunks. So I, as the assistant, uh, will write a lot of these up, put all these trainings, do workshops myself to provide them uh, and bring people in. Like we're bringing Paul Miller from Montgomery County uh, to do an AI training for our students so that they start getting that system. At. We just started this. Uh, so he's our first workshop. We started to work with it in class. Uh, so our sort of idea behind this is uh, this is flipping the work economy. 
uh, and why it's important to us and why we're, we're doing this with the curriculum is this because, you know, think about Star Trek, the replicator just flipped the entire work economy on everybody, gave them a lot of time to now do something with that time. And so that there's less chaos you kind of need a systematic approach to doing that. We're trying to help our students navigate that uh, because there's that famous quote of 90% of analytical work is preparation and 10% on analysis. Well, I think we can flip that economy. And what that means is that you've got 90 to 80% of your time for the analytical work. How do you do that? So by integrating it into a program approach across our classes, we can help them get that chaos in order because that's a lot of time now to have to assess all kinds of products. So all kinds of solutions, all kinds of avenues, uh, it can be kind of messy. And without sort of methodological training, you've, you, you, you can be lost easy and it'll take a while to get going. So what I've done, I'm not going to go through all of these. Is so all of our objectives <clears throat> that you saw in that curriculum makers, what I've done is I've put together the objective and off to the right is the activity that we are doing for each one of these objectives and talking with our instructors and we are giving demonstrations to our instructors we're sending them uh, a summarized research about how to do activities related to each one of these objectives depending on which course that they have so we've got eight total objectives and we have identified an activity that goes along with each. So, you know, <clears throat> train our students in gender bias. So we identify the courses as technical, analytical, or methodology, methodological, and assess for options for input because each one of these courses have a different approach to using Gen AI. And a lot of the times the methodological ones are trip up the, the instructors the most. They aren't quite sure how to use it because they're not programming in their class and they're not doing necessary complete analysis. They're like, well, how would I use that? Uh, so we we show them examples of that. So I'm gonna. So here's just the you know the rest of our objectives, but I'm gonna cut to um, an example of what we did with a class that was more methodological, where this was for students, but we're also using it for giving to the instructors to say, okay, you have a course like this where you're not doing much programming and you're doing more data prep and analytical work. Well, I, we did a I did a script uh, and generated this interrogation and i will say arguing with chat gpt to give it you know it's like a consultation with a colleague so we go through i you know and i go back and forth and i argue with it and i say that's not quite what i wanted uh can you do this can you adjust it and what i did when i was done with it so this serves the students they see because our students a lot of them i'm finding is like they're unsure how to use it so, and same way with the instructors. So we give them this document, but what we've added onto the side here are highlights of this document pointing out our interactions with ChatGPT to show you not only the interaction between the user and the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the system, but our assessment of it at the end to help instructors say, well, here's how you question it. You know, this is a, this is a, a post review of the chat that you had and can make use of it to sort of help refine your teaching strategies. So that's another artifact that we have. <laughs> so with our technical classes, you know, the idea is, is we're, we're trying to instruct our, uh, our instructors how to think about this. You're shifting the coding education process. You know, usually it was like write code from scratch, suffer with the minor syntax issues, spending all times trying to uh, debug uh, it, uh, minor issues from errors that are cryptic. And we're like, no, nah. it, it's like those days are gone. The, we are now in a time where we're going to have chat GPT generate the code and we're going to have to assess it. And in programming and computer science, you have this thing called program comprehension, where we are helping those instructors in the, that are part of that curriculum in this area to say, all right, Here's your approach. You let it generate the code, but the students still have to put it in the context of the subject, the data that they're using, and they're going to have to assess it. And they're still going to learn how to code because they still got to put all those code blocks together. <clears throat> so we've identified all those classes to do that, and we've developed materials specifically for the things that you're seeing on this slide um, so that they are 
systematically getting the same training uh, and letting them adjust in their classroom to how they want to do it. Some of our pro, some of our instructors use vignettes where the, the code generates like a, a, a publication quality document where others teach them how to do it right in the code. Uh, some of them spit out output and have them assess it. Uh, they've got their opportunities to, to have the freedom in the classroom to implement it, but we've shown them ways to to to, to use it. And uh, thank you. So this is an example in GES 66 and 6687, which are our programming uh, to our classes. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the four ways we do it. Let it let AI do the code generation. Um, we have it help us to refine and rewire the code it together so it fits the subject and the data and follows a method that the class assignment is to follow so that they learn that methodological approach and learn how to assess methodologically, produce documentation and narrative. And then we even tell, we even show them how to use it. Like, all right, your documentation's done. Give it the chat TPT to review for quality. Is, is there weaknesses? Is there strengths? And argue back and forth. It's kind of like a peer review process with, with the artificial intelligence for which, you know, you don't dispense with the human. You still have to, when you're done, good idea to take it to your colleagues, but you're much further along. You had more time to spend with developing it. So with our analytical classes, this is really that, you know, another example of that flipping the economy. Um, you know, you have more time to idea generate because you can give it ideas and assess a whole bunch of opportunities that you never would before. The most single, most difficult thing in science is to pick a topic to study. And when you start once you've done that, you have a multitude of solutions that you can explore, but you still only have enough time and resources to explore a few because you just don't have the time. But with the but how fast generate generative AI can spit things out gives you the idea of, oh my gosh, I can cover so much more and spend time trying to find a solution that may be more impactful that you would not have had other times to do. So we're showing how the, to select those things. So we use Gen AI in these classes for assessment of presentations and articles. Give it a bunch of articles and summarize. So in the end, you're not just taking everything that ChatGPT gives you. You, the human, still has to assess it, as we've seen in these workshops. You have to verify. You have to check it for facts. You still are the human, and you have to develop critical thinking skills in a way that is, is different. And so we're trying to provide those guides uh, to help our faculty do just that. Ron, I want to jump in as we're we're coming up against time. There are some good questions in the chat. Uh, that okay, I well, I'm just about done. It's the perfect timing. All right. Um, first question: Do all students and adjunct faculty have access to the same level of lar large language models? So, for example, Chat GPT 3.5 versus 4.0. No, uh, we're working on that. And I've been really disappointed with ChatGPT because uh, we try to keep it at 3.5 because that's the free version. Uh, and uh, we were we we're trying to get 4.0. But, you know, and if you go to ChatGPT's website, it says, hey, do you have do you have teams? Do you have groups? Do you have programs? Call us for pricing. <clears throat> so I contacted them and I said, hey, I've got a faculty of about Pen. I've got about 24 graduate students in, in my program. Uh, how, you know, what can we do for a pricing? Because it seems like your team approach. Well, they came back and said, oh, yeah, we got pricing for that. 20 bucks a month for each one of you. I'm like, that's the same thing as just buying. And you're not giving me a deal. We can't afford that. Um, <laughs> you know, so they, they were not helpful. So we're exploring other avenues because the university itself is doing a lot with generative AI and I'm starting to connect with others out there. And I eventually think that something's going to happen because I almost want to smack them upside the head and say, we're teaching people to use your tool, you know, in higher education right. and you're not cutting us a deal. <laughs> anyway. Another question. question in the chat. Have you gotten any pushback or hesitation from instructors in your program about incorporating AI? And if so, how have you handled that? No, I've not gotten really any pushback other than how much time do you really need us to spend on this? And we're we, we recognize that they're adjuncts. So we're not, uh, you, you know, we said, look, so they've only pushed back in the sense of how fast do you want us to do this? How much do you want us to do this? And we said, look, we don't expect you to like 
suddenly apply this all in one semester. We want you to sort of start dabbling with it. Introduction into your, your classes. We will help you, and we by providing all these resources, <clears throat> an easier way into it. So maybe the first semester you use it, you do it with a couple of classes or a section of a class. And, but the second semester we do expect you to do a little bit more, and then by you know a year and a half, two out, four, three, four semesters that you're really engaged with it, you're starting to figure out how much uh, you're going to use it in your class and for what. And we just kind of settle with them on that. You know, we we, we don't expect uh, it to be, you know, full on. I, I like using it for a lot of things, but the other instructors don't. They don't see the need for it. And we give them that room, but we do require them to, to have a little bit. So we the only pushback is, has been that. And once we've let them know that, look, you've got time and our expectations are that we do a gradual process because it's going to take time for you to figure out. And they seem alleviated by that. Wonderful. Well, Ron, I want to thank you for this most informative session. There were a lot of positive comments in the chat. A lot of individuals uh, would like to see links or the, the documents themselves, and we will be gathering that information and sending uh, slides out to the uh, participants. And we want to thank you for attending this um, conference today. It, it's been very informative colleagues across the state are doing great things and you'll be hearing more about generative AI and upcoming events. So thank you all for attending. Yeah, I'm super excited. Are the chats able to be free to read afterwards? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. All those, so happy to share. Okay, great. Thank you all. Thank you.